over the weekend. Uh, obviously, uh, a couple unfortunate situ situations with um, um, you know the shooting downtown. Of course, the passing of of our PPD K9 Sino that uh, we had had the memorial procession yesterday, and uh, certainly heart breaks for Officer Harris and uh, and our our police department. Um, and um, you know, so a, a very difficult day I know for, for Officer, Officer Harris and our team, and um, so uh, certainly want to mention that and, and condolences to him and his family. And we, you know, in these situations, how close uh, that an officer gets to to their uh, canine. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, yeah, certainly difficult day, and and uh, you know, prayers goes out to their family and our PPD family for for that. And, and, happening so unexpectedly also uh, again shooting uh, from the, over the weekend um, I've got if you have any questions on that uh, Chief Randall is here and can uh, take any questions that you have um, the uh, monitor recycling drop-off uh, the site results uh, that we had it was a great turnout uh, for our first weekend we were open from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. and we took in over 1100 pounds uh, total recyclables and and again I point out these are uh, recyclables within really four categories that uh, actually do have a market which means they actually will uh, turn out to be uh, you know them being turned in will now be a benefit to the environment so uh, 1100 pound, pounds total and zero percent contamination so um, so again we'll continue to do that on Saturdays from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. at 2759 North Palafox uh, there uh, at our city facility located between Tahar Drive and Leonard Street. Uh, as we've maintained, that is not our sole long-term solution. Uh, we'll continue to do this if we see uh, that there's a lot of activity for it and that there's that, that this is helpful uh, to, to at least have one pressure release valve on the, the fact that we have gone away from curbside, that you know we'll continue to push this forward, as well as look at expanded assisted drop-off uh, opportunities and um, I'm expecting to hear back from uh, from a third-party vendor about the potential for opt-in curbside recycling, trying to get a cost estimate on what we think that would be. Um, so we've had several meetings on that. So I, I expect within the next couple of weeks we should get some so, uh, updates of substance in terms of the long-term plan for recycling. So, again, I don't want it to be confused that um, that uh, that this is our only solution long-term for, for uh, how we – become better recyclers here in the city of Pensacola, but, uh, but that's a great first start. Uh, 620 pounds of cardboard, 185 pounds of PET-1 plastic, 186 of number two plastic, uh, 80 pounds of aluminum cans, and 82 pounds of steel cans is the total, so over 1,100 pounds. Um, so much appreciated, and I, uh, thank you to Fred and the sanitation department uh, for getting that stood up and going. And uh, from all reports, it seemed to go pretty seamlessly. We had I'd seen a couple thank yous from from our citizens to staff who were very helpful in you know helping them get everything out of their car and, and all of that. So so excited to see that positive step forward. Uh, our fire department had uh, uh, their car seat rodeo, which was an overwhelming success. Uh, we couldn't actually, uh, way more than we expected. I know that 100 people were assisted. Uh, I think PPD had to come in and help direct traffic, uh, as a matter of fact, during the event. So it ended up being uh, uh, multiple public safety <laughs> um, organizations involved, not just the fire department, but uh, 95 car seats were provided to families in need. And um, it, we also were able to help people that had a car seat and just make sure that it was that it was uh, installed correctly. And if if you want your car seat checked, you can still, just just like uh, with smoke alarms, you, you don't have to wait for something like this, an event like this, uh, that you can call PFD headquarters 436-5200 to make an appointment to come to check your car seat, as well as uh, to call that number for a smoke alarm if, if needed in your home. The, uh, I'll mention again, because it, I know it will go to uh, uh, the council on Thursday, we talked about it briefly in the agenda conference yesterday about our Sun Trail application that we would submit to to, uh, to the uh, shared use non-motorized trail grant program, also known as the Sun Trail. And um, it's, to, it's a $200 million one-time injection by the Senate president. And uh, I, again, I'm very thankful to our team, Public Works, Transportation, uh, our administrators uh, for for hopping on this and making sure that the city of Pensacola is in the best position possible uh, to get uh, 
a, a fair shot at that, those $200 million that are going to go out statewide. So it'll be two applications. One is from the Three Mile Bridge to Tarragona Street, ultimately, and the other is from Tarragona Street to the Bayou Chico Bridge. Um, so they'll be submitted separately, uh, and they're both about, uh, I believe, at last check, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, about $4 million a piece was our uh, general estimate, so $8 million in total. Uh, so we've been working with our uh, legislative delegation and, and making sure that, that um, we prime the pump as best we can to, to help advocate for those projects. And, and a special thank you to FDOT. We have met with them. Amy, David, myself went over to Chipley in the last few weeks to talk about this and several other things. Uh, but uh, but we've gotten a lot of uh, positive feedback and support from FDOT, and and also I know that they've had discussions with central office about uh, especially the bay, the bayfront portion, and they're helping us with design and some other things like that. So that's usually a good in indicator that there's some uh, support for the project if FDOT uh, jumps in and helps with design. And if you compare the active transportation plan and the results of that, and where you see a lot of that crash data and some of our biggest pain points as it relates to the ATP. Uh, this would serve a great need uh, there already uh, on top of the fact that uh, having Bayfront Parkway done would certainly help connect some of our neighborhoods to downtown that are a pretty difficult connection right now like East Hill, East Pensacola Heights in a protected manner uh, and I, I think it could become really uh, safety is the number one goal but really become an amenity for us I mean it would be uh, you know that's a beautiful stretch of road and a stretch of uh, uh, of path that that would be for people to walk and bike and and to be connected all the way into Gulf Breeze in a protected fashion, I think would be a great asset for us. So, so we're very excited about that project, very enthusiastic about it, and we've got our fingers crossed that uh, we're able to get some of that central funding. Uh, also, you may have heard the Fricker Center Multipurpose Community Facility Grant. Uh, our application is in uh, for that, for the $4 million Multipurpose Community Facility, or MPCF grant, and uh, it would uh, what our application will show is uh, that we would have a facility at Fricker Center, could, uh, potentially a separate facility at Fricker Center that would uh, be a dedicated senior center with health education and outreach, a career education lab and cyber lounge and ADA friendly upgrades like the playground, entrances, restrooms, along with an enhanced resource library. So um, that would be on top of the $5.5 million of Sally CDBG money that Fricker has already been awarded with a total of, that would be $9.5 million if we were able to get all three of those. Um, Career Source Escarosa has uh, jumped in to be uh, a, um, on our application that, that it was asked for us to find partners that, that would be committed to these projects. Career Source has done that, and I've asked Baptist Hospital to uh, also do that. And it is a multi year commitment um, and doesn't have any financial numbers or anything like that. But what we would look for is for Baptist Hospital to potentially have its, uh, its faith based community outreach. Um, like going around to senior sitters, churches, doing vaccinations. That's, a, that's some of the work that Baptist is already doing, but it's not really housed in one place. So we've asked Baptist and they have obliged that, that you would actually make the home uh, of that entire initiative that they have would be at Fricker Center. So uh, you'd be able to also have intake and, and help uh, again with some of these senior services. As you know, we really only have one senior center in the city. Uh, and so to be able to have that hybrid approach that we can provide services as well as some opportunity for, for seniors, we think was a great way to put that together. So again, uh, thanks to Joel and Kevin and finance department, uh, a lot of people uh, helping make this grant, a rea this grant application a reality. And uh, we'll, we expect to hear something in January uh, would be the next update there. Uh, we had a, just a, a delay on, I, cause I had mentioned November, I wanna make sure I correct. We're gonna, we're gonna have a public hearing to consider the proposed amendment for the building height land development code. Um, proposal that will be uh, at the December 14th meeting. Uh, obviously, you saw it wasn't on the agenda of this meeting. Um, no, no, j just an administrative um, issue on, on the delay, not no other reason than that. Uh, but you may have seen the planning board recommended approval at their October 10th meeting, and it was voted unanimously. So, um, so anyway, that that's the reason you won't see it in November, but it'll go to December. Uh, Roger Scott Tennis Center, we're about 90% complete there. All the pavement is done. Uh, the acrylic layer will be applied next week, November 13 through 17. Of course, all of this is always weather permitted. So, um, And uh, after the acrylic goes on, we've got placement of sod, minor concrete work, installation of 
the posts and the tennis netting, the fencing, and the general site cleanup. So um, that that is where we are with Roger Scott, and we still were looking for that January. I, I don't want to commit to an exact week or anything, but looking into that very first part of the year um, in, in terms of being open with all of the new courts. Uh, I'll have a State of the City address in partnership with Civicon at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, November 14th, and it's at Sanders Beach Community Center. So if you're someone that goes to a lot of Civicons, you know a lot of them are at the Rex. So just note the, the venue change. It will be at Sanders Beach from 6 to 7.30. And uh, also a couple days later, I'll have a District 5 town hall with Councilwoman Tanyane Broughton, uh, November 16th at the Cobb Center, 601 East Mallory Street, and that will be uh, at 5.30 on Thursday, November 16th. And of course, it'll be streamed on Facebook uh, and everything else. And I know that uh, Civicon and the News Journal will be uh, streaming the State of the City address, I'm sure, as well. Uh, lastly, the uh, just a reminder, our offices are closed Friday for Veterans Day. So um, that will be City Hall, the administrative offices, and as usual, the exceptions are the tennis center and the golf course. So uh, with that, oh, at sanitation schedule as well. Uh, Monday and Tuesday, residents will see no change uh, to garbage, yard waste, bulk pickup. Uh, the Thursday pickup will be collected on Wednesday the 8th, and the Friday pickup will be collected on Thursday the 9th. So we're actually moving those two ahead uh, this week. So if you do have normally have Friday pickup like I do, uh, that'll, that'll be moving to Thursday, and Thursday will be moving to Wednesday. So uh, with that, uh, happy to take your questions. And again, Chief is here as well if you have any questions PPD-related. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'd, I'll defer to Chief on that in terms of what can or can't be shared. Oh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, could you please repeat the question? I wasn't able to hear. Is, is there any new information uh, about the shooting this weekend that you can release now? No, no, I wouldn't say there's any any new information. So um, we responded. We got we we got a call for a shooting there on Palafox uh, within one minute uh, in a few seconds. Um, PPD was on scene about four minutes. Uh, we had the sus suspect in custody. Uh, he's been identified and charged with attempted murder and you know, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. So he's a prohibited person from carrying a firearm. So um, investigation still continues on. In any case, well, we got a prohibited person from carrying a firearm to figure out where that firearm came came from. So we'll be doing e trace and working with our partners to kind of figure out where that firearm origin is. Was the victim also homeless? Um, yes, yeah, so from the information we have, we didn't have a, a permanent address for the, for the victim, yes, sir. Were there any other issues, you know, with PPD being downtown patrolling, were there any other issues with either one of these individuals that y'all had any prior problems with? Um, one individual, um, one we've had some prior contact with, but the other we haven't had any contact um, contact with, with 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 respect to the suspect. Uh, we don't have any um, documented uh, criminal history for here in Pensacola with, with that individual. Okay. City of Pensacola, I should say. Right. Do you know what his felony was for? Um, I'm not 100% sure on, on what, what is found because I hadn't looked at specific as, as criminal history, but, I, but it was a documented felony where it uh, allowed us to charge with the um, felon in possession of a firearm. So. Okay. Is there a way we can get that information as far as where his felony was committed? And I won't be able to provide that criminal justice history information, but um, I'm sure if you, you have avenues as a um, reporter, you better get it. I can't, I can't provide that information. So. Do your work. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know. Um, by, by law, I can't provide that. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. All right, Chief. Thanks. All right. And, you know, this obviously the incident's unfortunate. And um, as I say, it, incidents like this in a busy part, even in the middle of the night, in a busy part of our downtown, is, as I say, it's a crime on our quality of life, too. Um, and so we take those very seriously. Um, and it's why we have put forth the efforts that we have so far in terms of adding additional staffing, adding additional outreach, and um, you know certainly welcome our our uh, community partners and homeless reduction partners, um, you know to to help us, uh, you know every way that they can that we aren't just sitting back um, and doing nothing. I think um, you know it, again. 
quality of life crimes matter and and it affects the perception of our city the perception of our downtown and um, while it's unrealistic to assume that if someone is going to do something like this that we could be standing right over their shoulder uh, we know that that uh, that, that situation uh, is difficult being there one minute being one minute away and having additional night staffing as we've had uh, with CRA the ad addition of CRA officers over the weekends I know has uh, you know helped us in this situation as well so um, so you know again very very unfortunate and um, you know, we'll do the best we can to make sure we bring uh, uh, bring this individual to justice. Mayor, would you uh, describe what the vision is for the Bayfront Parkway Sun Trail yeah. app? Uh, I know you mentioned during agenda review that you were looking to shrink the medians. Right. Would you talk yeah, more sure. about what, what this might look like if the grant is approved? Yeah. Um, a couple important points i mean if you next time you drive on bayfront parkway you see there's uh the sidewalk actually abuts the 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 uh i mean it, there's not even any grass between the sidewalk in some instances uh that with the old infrastructure that we have it's basically right up against the street and uh i'm sure if i were to go back and research the design the uh, the last design enhancement of bayfront parkway the idea of putting these big wide medians in was for beautification for um uh, maybe other reasons I'm not aware of, but the reality is uh, while the divided highway does provide some safety to the vehicle, uh, the, the superfluous amount of 12, 13, 14 feet, uh, uh, you know, wide in some areas, uh, that's also, by the way, something that the state and or city has to maintain, uh, you know, and is not user friendly at all. You're obviously not going to have anybody in the middle of the street. So uh, we, really what you're looking at is a reallocation of that width so if you think about when you think about the entire width being from uh, the north mo the 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 paint on the north northernmost side uh to the paint on the southernmost side if you take all of that width and redistribute it how, what we're saying is that we're going to be able to get the uh the width that's being used within the existing medians extract it move that to the south side uh and and make the, those um those medians more narrow therefore reallocating that space for a protected uh, bike and walk path along the south side of Bayfront Parkway. So it's important to point out in case I get questions uh, about there is no, what's not being proposed is a lane reduction. Um, you know, that's one of the questions that we've gotten over the years is, does that mean we'd go down to two lanes on Bayfront? It, is that, that is not being entertained. Um, that what we're saying is let's just, let's use the space that we have between the lines in a smarter way and and something that helps us at human scale not just helps the cars move along so there would there will be no travel impact negative travel impact as as being proposed now uh to someone in a vehicle uh, all this will do is greatly enhance the the safety the livability the walkability of our community uh on the south side that you can do that in a protected way it's, when you say protected uh, what does that exactly mean barriers uh it it can mean a lot of things uh, i don't know if that with fdot's design whether that's been finalized or not i know there's been conversation you know my personal preference is always deferred to be some kind of uh tree some kind of you know a protection yeah not a I, you know i don't envision a concrete uh, you know um uh wall uh, or anything like that that there'd be some aesthetic certainly some aesthetic value to to the driver and to the pedestrian but uh, i'd have to look and see if uh, I, I don't know that we've gotten to a point where that has exactly the material has been finalized but uh, but my expectation would be that there'd be aesthetic value and as well as shade i mean if you think about the tree canopy along uh, bayfront it's non-existent so you know in, in our heat in our climate uh you know if there's the ability to to provide some kind of shade always a balance on a state road and what you can plant and all those things but um, but you know we'll look for every opportunity to make uh, to, to make that as enjoyable as possible as well as safe. On that, you said the, the grant you said earlier hey, about eight million. Um, is that the, the backup in the city council agenda has a budget for six point four million? Is that are y'all seeking more than that? Or uh, the, the last number I saw that's why I was asking Amy I thought it was eight million. Um, we'd ha I'd have to if the numbers got updated you. Know, we looked at a lot of different facets of this project and I, I would have to we can research it for you there's also been some dollars there's already some existing dollars for west main right. 
um, that are not part of this Sun Trail. So maybe I'm totaling up both of those. Let me get those exact details for you. But the the general way I've looked at it is each of these are split into about a four million dollar project. You know, but whether that comes from the Sun Trail bucket of money or other monies that if I, I know they've discussed at the TPO meeting that there's about there's somewhere in that two and a half million dollar range for West Main uh, over there. So how those marry together, I'll, I'll have to you know look exactly. But I've just my general rule of thumb has been about eight million in total. So um, but uh, you know there's ways we calculate that we don't just get to ask whatever number we want. You know there's ways that we would calculate for that um, that uh, that I'm sure FDOT is going to review. So. Um, so we'll get the dollar amount to do it the best way that we can. Uh, and, and if you look at that map, you'll also see there's the conversation about potentially when you get to E Street, actually bringing the, the mixed use path down Cypress because of some of our limitations. Uh, we've also been in separate converse, conversations with the, the rail company that owns the rail that comes into A Street, uh, obviously related to this project, but, but a separate conversation about potential abandonment of some of that rail bed uh, for us regardless of whether we get this money or not that's something that we'll continue to pursue if we can um, and and we appreciate them you know reaching out we're trying to work through some different things that um, uh, that they're asking of us and we're asking of them but uh, ultimately we're looking at uh, there's the potential that we could take the rail from a street to d street uh, that we would be able to potentially have that abandoned um, and uh, but because of the lumber yard there on F that still uses it uh, that, and they need the ability to back up uh, that we don't know that we could get it all the way to E but that's certainly a great improvement because as you know we have a rail bed sitting there uh, in grass right now that's not maintained and you know, not kept up and doesn't really provide any value uh, to the city and certainly that acreage that that square footage would be extremely valuable to us in terms of, of some kind of mixed use path. So, um, so, so there's some variables on what we would do. Maybe it would just be a sidewalk that went on Main to Barrancas, but then the make the wider path where we need the room maybe go down Cypress. Um, so that, that you'll see that in the proposals. You'll see kind of two different where it kind of forks uh, forks off, but. Uh, but the Bayfront one's a little cleaner in terms of we know what we're asking for. You know, F again, FDOT is helping with design. So we've broken them up that way accordingly. Yeah. Are you hearing about an update on the uh, Welcome to Pensacola site? Yeah, actually, I think we just had some uh, development on that. I just it came across my desk um, that I know that there were some minor edits coming back from FDOT. Remember, we work alongside them. This is in this is part of their project, part of their funding. Uh, but uh, I think we're moving ahead. Do we have an exact construction? Yeah, Amy, if you want to give an update. Yes, so we have the design complete, and right now we're going through DOT to get their approval on what we have designed. Um, right now it's just a discussion on whether or not we have to get a community aesthetic feature application approved or whether or not our agreement with them um, originally will be sufficient enough to get them to give us the, the go ahead. Um, once we get that go ahead from DOT, then we can go ahead and move forward with getting the construction documents out there for solicitation. Is, is the design you're working with now the same one that the city approved earlier? Correct, correct. All right. Mayor, on the homeless issue yeah. keeps coming up. Uh, are we making any sort of progress? Every time it comes up and we have evictions in the county, the, the part of every news story is, well, we need something. But mm -hmm. nothing seems that something never happens. Yeah. Where, where are we? It, yeah, it's a, it, obviously it's a difficult situation. Um, and, you know, the folks at, at the continuum of care were probably – uh, you know, would, would know better, and this is what they live every day. Um, but uh, as you've asked before and I've mentioned, certainly when something closes, uh, we, we see uh, uh, an increase in, in, um, in homeless presence, uh, in panhandling. And, you know, uh, really, uh, you know, that's, that's my focus right now is, um, you know, that I've been around a lot of advocates for helping the homeless my entire life, and I can tell you what we all agree on. I don't care if you're the the biggest advocate for homeless or uh, the biggest adversary 
uh, to the homeless. What we all agree on is uh, panhandling isn't good for a community. Um, and uh, when you see a greater presence downtown, um, you know, I think it's a pretty safe assumption to say you see a greater presence downtown because uh, that, that of, of panhandling because the panhandlers would see a benefit to be there. Uh, and so, you know, I think we need to have a conversation as a community about what's the best way to help the people who really need help and the people who want help. And there are a great number of those people in this community. Um, but, uh, but sitting unsafely at a street corner, sitting in the middle, going out in the middle of an intersection and the people in our community or the visitors in our community that are helping, uh, enable that, uh, is, is a significant problem, uh, for us. And it's something that, that we need to address. I know the County, uh, is addressing some, uh, a public safety, uh, ordinance that, that, uh, limits whether you're homeless or you're not, whether you're, if you're in the street. If you're selling anything in the street, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but that this is uh, to to ensure that the safety of motorists and the safety of the individuals at the street corner, um, that's something that we've been looking into as well. I know that there's been some conversation between the city and the county about um, about ordinance like that. I believe Jacksonville just had one passed um, uh, recently, I believe. Uh, and I think the grace period on that just ended maybe earlier this year. Um, so. Um, so we see that um, it, it, it's not an easy situation. You know, a lot of people on Facebook will will can go take photos and say, why isn't something done? That's the easy part to identify that. The difficult part is how do we how do we enforce something and how do we enforce something fairly and legally? That's what the real question is. So, you know, uh, I, I, I will as you can imagine, I've had a lot of conversations about this issue uh, since I was running for this office, since I've been in this office. And what I usually ask uh, when someone sa provides that and say, look, you know, if, if number one, if any mayor or any county administrator had the be, be all end all solution that was fair to everybody and that followed the law, then we'd all be doing it. So that's number one. And, and, and number two is I always ask and I, I remain anybody listening. If you have a solution out there that we, that the city should entertain about how we handle this issue. We, as we always are with any issue, we, we like hearing from from and, and there's a, lots of smart people who live here, lots of good ideas. Uh, but usually when I ask that question, then someone says, well, I'm not a lawyer, you know, and, and we end up kind of back in the same place that we're in. So um, so, you know, we're we are working through it. We are trying to be diligent. We are trying to be diligent in terms of our patrol, try and, and, and again, trying to get a hand up for services. But this is not. Uh, an issue that is uh, relegated only to the city. This has to be all of us. I mean, this 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 issue helping people who need help uh, is is an issue for all of us. The city, the county, our COC, and everybody else. And so, um, you know, we are doing the best that we can, and uh, and we continue to pursue uh, ways to make sure that that people who need opportunity uh, to be to for a hand up that they are given that, and that people who are not here for an opportunity for a hand up, but to create crimes on our quality of life are handled appropriately. So um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll continue to progress and try to make good decisions and fair decisions and equitable decisions on that moving forward. Is that one of the hopes of the continuum of care looking at that reorganization? Yeah, uh, look, I, I think why we, why we had Dr. Savage come here and why we've, it is, uh, you know, what we've always done is it cutting it. So what, what we've got to we've got to start saying what can we do what are our opportunities um, and and this is not it, it should not be adversarial this should not be this is not a territorial issue this is all of us and that's what I mean is you know how can the city help how can the county help how can our COC how can our our community partners help and the reason we brought Dr Savage in is so we can all get our arms around this issue and try to come up with the best path forward um, so I'm I continue to be committed to that. Um, I get the sense sometimes that not everybody's committed to that, uh, but I certainly am. Uh, I don't have any enemies in this in this uh, situation. I don't have any adversaries. Uh, anybody in in the uh, in this community that thinks that there's something that we can do that makes better outcomes for our quality of life and better outcomes for people who need help, I'm all ears, um, and I hope everybody else takes the same posture. Um, and so, if there's a way for us to increase funding that we can support that gets more dollars in to, to reduce homelessness here, uh, I'm, I'm very much in favor of and we'll do anything that anybody asks us to. We are continuing to look into, uh, and we've had several conversations about the potential for a low barrier shelter. 
in the city. Um, and uh, you know, we believe that that is one of the steps that if we are going to be able to delineate between people who need help and people who are not here for help, uh, we've got to have a place to, for someone to be able to, to receive that help. Um, I met with the, uh, while I was at MICD in Boston, um, actually I've got a phone call this week with um, the, uh, the mayor of Gainesville was there and, and they, the city had um, uh, financed a, a, a low barrier shelter and is operating a low barrier shelter. So I have a call with the director of that uh, this week and to, to learn more about best practices. You know, what did they, what are their learn? What did they learn? What are their takeaways? What are the costs associated with that? Because uh, there's a capital cost that we all know to set up a low barrier shelter. But what we, what we don't have a good grip on is the operational cost. I mean, this is certain, something that's going to certainly take a subsidy uh, and, and, and it's going to have to be an operational subsidy uh, at some point. And uh, not that I'm suggesting that the city be in the business of operating it itself. I think you would look for a community partner that's qualified to do that. Um, but we're, I, right now I'm in the analysis mode of getting my entire arms around what the cost of a low barrier shelter is and, um, and what I'm calling an opportunity center. And, and that means would you like to go to the Opportunity Center where you can be given opportunity? Um, and uh, that's what we're going to be asking. And, and so that's where we are moving forward. I, I know that the county is moving forward with looking at some affordable uh, rental housing. Uh, that is part of this process. And certainly I think those need to go hand in hand. I, I think if the city's going to make this effort, uh, it's necessary that, that those dollars get put in play uh, for rental housing because we know that the, a shelter, including the existing shelters now, only get us so far. And if we don't have anybody who is making progress in that shelter, if they don't have any opportunity to get out and live anywhere, uh, we're going to really be back in the same choke point and the same problem we have now. So, um, so I don't think you can really do one without the other. Um, and even though one is kind of a city project and one has kind of been adopted as this county project with their four million dollars, um, I certainly hope that we that we are jumping into that hand in hand and and I think for for us to have the maximum impact we're going to have to do that so um, so again we continue to move forward with trying to find opportunity for people who want help yeah. Mayor, this was a pretty vibrant weekend in the city yeah uh, are you comfortable as as these big festive weekends grow like this that uh, the city of the, the, the traffic and the pedestrian safety all of that is well taken care of, or, or is there room to improve as as these things grow? I mean, it was uh, you probably were down there, so you you're aware of it. Well, uh, what I'd say is the same stat we were talking about with parking. We had 5.6 million transactions uh, through cell phone uh, data. 5.6 million transactions with downtown in 2020. We had 8.3 the last 12 months. So. Um, as I said, uh, you know, unless someone starts talking about all the bed bugs we've got here, people, people are going to be coming here in droves. And, and that's a, what a great problem to have. What, uh, I, I imagine there are a lot of mayors that are very envious of getting a question like that, that get to say, well, man, this is such a great place to be and that we keep breaking records at our airport and we keep having people come in to our community. Uh, how do we best manage that? And it, it does need to be managed. Um, and, and to be honest with you, that's, the largest primary motivation around the parking reform is to say, as we delve into what is here, it, we see these additional transactions, we see more and more people wanting to be in this place. Uh, how do we plan for the future? How do we not put ourselves in a situation where uh, it's time for structured parking and we have no money to, to, to build it? Or it's time for, uh, you know, other infrastructure that, that can help relieve some of that pressure and we don't have any money for it. If we were to get down there at that time, they'd say, well, why didn't the mayor plan? For that, but the mayor's trying to plan for that right now, and, and they're asking, and they're asking the mayor why he's doing it. So, um, you know, it's maybe it's glass half full or half empty. But I, I look at uh, th that this is a great problem for us to have is that we have a downtown that people enjoy and that people want to spend a lot of time in. And um, is it our obligation to help manage that and make sure that we are prepared for this growth? Absolutely. Um, and that's what we're trying to do right now. Uh, I think especially through uh, parking and, and potential parking revenue that would help fund capital projects that would help us uh, because where, where are these taking place? The vast majority of these are taking place in what this parking benefits district that's being proposed would be. Uh, and, and this would give us some actual dollars to be able to go uh, help reinvest to make it a better experience for everybody. Does the CRA play a, a bigger role in things like structured parking in these districts? 
Sure, I think uh, obviously the Urban Core CRA has you know has the funding to, and, and I think we look at that in a lot of different ways. We we right now the CRA is busy doing things that we've never done before between Pensacola Motor Lodge and getting an RFP with Florida Housing about how those units are going to be used. Um, we're looking at how we're going to get highest and best use at Pensacola Sports and, and what, what kind of tax base and revenue that we could have in replace of a single story building there. Um, you know, and Malcolm Young as well, uh, you know, that potential for workforce housing that, that CRA is playing a role in. So this is some new territory for our CRA, and I think it's a very positive step. Those are all things that we know how important housing is. We know how important our tax base is uh, to helping support police, fire, and others. So, um, so you know, we, we're, we have really approached a lot of unprecedented ter territory, and I, I think we should always be opportunistic with our, with our CRA and, and if we think that it's a good investment and that the citizen's getting a good return on their investment. The, the CRA's Urban Core Advisory Board hasn't met in quite some time, and I've been told by your staff that uh, some members have turned out and they, there is no replacement. So what is your message to potential citizens who would want to participate yeah. in that. Well, look, I think uh, so much of what we do is rooted in citizen engagement. Um, and uh, you know, uh, even my background with helping start Civicon, and we saw, we've saw we seen a different way in the, the, that even our citizens communicate about different issues that affect us in the city is that we you know come, well, I think because of things like Civicon, we, it comes from a, a different foundational basis of knowledge that we may not have had without getting these national experts um, to come in. As it pertains, I, I couldn't speak to you know exact details of the last handful of meetings and when and why, but what I could tell you in a general sense is during the conversation with the council that they had worked up uh, looking at different boards and making different changes, you know, are these boards needed? Do we make some policy changes? I know that was one of the conversations was how the, the marriage between East Side, West Side, and Urban Core CRAs and, and making sure we have enough engagement and enough representation in each one of those um, because there's a lot of differences in those. East Side CRA does not have uh, really really any money in it, um, very little. Urban Core does. Um, and so I know there was a conversation floated about about maybe consolidating into a, some kind of CRA board with, with equitable representation um, you know, for the three different districts. Would that help? Um, so, I mean, I, I, I would talk to, in terms of, you know, I'd defer to Victoria and, and uh, Hillary and those, those folks that are doing it every day about the best step forward. I, I wouldn't want to speculate on that. Uh, but citizen engagement is important to us. And, and uh, you know, the, the, best way to, uh, uh, the best way to see a positive change and impact positive change is, is to be in it. You know, you can email me, uh, that, but the next phase is to be in it and help us make these decisions. And that's what we hope people want to do. So, uh, so we always want as much engagement as possible. Follow up on the on the homeless subject. Um, so, the low barrier shelter. I, are you saying you're not the city, you're not interested in the city running that? You want to partner with the community organization? Uh, and do you have any organizations in mind? Or? Yeah, and I mean it, we do. I don't want to, you know, put some, we're, we're we're not far enough along to say you know this organization or that. I don't want you know they have boards. <laughs> you know, I'm sure they would need to look at the situation, and I don't want to speak for them. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think our our primary focus would be um, an outside agency, a proven outside agency that that knows how to do this, uh, get in and, and operate it, and not have the city reinvent the wheel uh, and operate it internally. Uh, so how that partnership will work, that's, the, again, the analysis that we're doing is, you know, if we have these ARPA dollars and we're able to, to help with capital, help with renovation, help with potential operations, and then, but, but we're, we're trying to get a price tag, you know, right now and make sure we understand before we delve into, um, you know, frankly, I think we, I was a little uncomfortable. We were getting a little further down the road on just focused on, on what the, the upfront capital costs would be. Um, and I, I think it's more prudent for us to understand that the last thing we want to do is set something up that isn't sustained, uh, you know, and so what good does that do us if we end up with a, with a shelter or any, any type of opportunity uh, to, to reduce homelessness, the last thing you want to do is put someone in a position where we open and then have to close something. So, uh, so I want to get as good understanding as we can what the, what the entire price tag is before we were to to uh, you know, start expending those funds or start proposing that, but uh, but I think the costs are built into those three things: it's the, the the capital for for a potential site, the renovation of that site, 
and and what kind of expected assistance would it take uh, from the city and county and other parts coc and other partners to you know help keep it running so um so we're that's the analysis again that i'm in now and that, that we've been in and uh, you know we continue to work towards i guess um is it is it realistic to try to do anything about panhandling without a low barrier shelter operating and at what point does it become so critical that the city or is going to have to step in and open yeah, um, what I could say to the first question is, I, I think the general, the discouragement of panhandling and enabling panhandling is something that we have to address. Uh, and I, th I think, uh, again, we're, we're looking into what those steps might be from a safety standpoint. What, um, and, and so uh, how that intertwines with increase in pan, you know, I don't have any, uh, you know, fresh data from our community about the, the, the correlation, except that we just generally know that when we see a camp shut down, we see an increase of, of, of presence of, of the homeless um, in the city and in the downtown area. Um, and we also know from talking to partners that, that are in, uh, you know, working in shelters uh, or, or, or providing services to reduce homelessness is that we are reaching this choke point of, of having people come in, uh, but maybe not have an opportunity to get out and move into, to, um, you know, a better situation. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that the general idea of, of that, when you put a dollar out your window, that that is somehow uh, helping create opportunity for people uh, is quite a misnomer. I think we, need, we have to understand that there's a better way to help people who really need it. And, and uh, you know, that, that the guilt uh, of being at an intersection and seeing someone, uh, you know, panhandling is not going to get us out of this situation. Uh, what we, we've got to face the reality that w if we put the services in place that allow us to help everyone who wants a hand up, then we can start to, I, I think, really see a, a, you know, a positive impact. But, uh, but enabling panhandling right now is not getting us anywhere. And, um, you know, we've got to, uh, you know, as a community face this head on and, and, and decide that, you know that that dollar that five dollars that ten dollars is better invested in people pro providing services providing meals providing opportunity um so again anything that we can do to advocate for that we certainly will so, so i guess is, at what point does the city if you can't find a community partner or anything like step in and decide to operate uh, it's too early to, to say that i i, I think I think as we were to get into an implementation process of this, we would have identify, you know, who those, um, you know, who, the, who that operator would be. And I can tell you just on a general sense of the kind of what if conversations that, you know, we have, we have received interest from uh, that, that, you know, what if we did this, would you look at it? We, we've gotten some positive response from that. As I said, I don't want to put nonprofits that are already operating other things and boards under any type of expectation or responsibility it's too early at this point uh, but we asked that question for that exact reason we certainly didn't want to go too far down the road if we thought uh, we didn't have anybody available we, we feel comfortable enough that there'd be organizations or multiple organizations that that would entertain it uh, but they're going to ask the questions that we should we are asking right now which is what's the support going to be what's the you know what's the long-term viability uh, of of this project and and so i think the city and the county need to be prepared to answer that before we were to get into a serious conversation with an operator. Yeah, I guess the, the follow up is that uh, are there discussions with the county or with the continuum of care of uh, these doors for, for other funding opportunities? Or is there like at the federal level that type of thing? Um, not yet. We, we've had several. Uh, I'm, uh, myself, uh, Councilwoman Patton's been involved. Uh, um, Liz Kissel, Wes Moreno, uh, we've had several meetings about, you know, a multitude of issues in this uh, topic, um, you know, site visits at potential locations, um, those kinds of things. So we, we have had some substantive conversations uh, about that. And uh, again, what I hope is that as we get aligned with progress towards an opportunity center that we would have the county um, also as you've seen, as you guys have reported, you know, that they are trying to, to make steps towards expending their funds because you know, th their effort is only a, uh, their effort would be 
dampened by us not doing anything and our effort would be dampened by them not doing anything. So I think um, I, I certainly get the indication that the, the county is willing to do that. Uh, but but I do think that that uh, we can't have one of us run out of the starting gate with a plan without the other side of this being implemented or close to being implemented. So um, so, I, I, you know, I, I, as we get closer, we're not ready for that yet. But as we get closer and we start to feel comfortable with what uh, what decision the city would want to make, you know, I would want to make sure that that, uh, you know, we're clear and and transparent and continue to be communicative with the county as we've been uh, to kind of say this is the direction we want to go how are things going with you guys and make sure that uh, that they're involved as well mayor just a quick follow-up you, you use the term opportunity center is this an, a new term or is this embodied in some sort of planning effort uh yeah it's a, a new term i guess uh you know i, I as is this I, I heard it I, I heard it and and it's what my vision is for it that 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 this is not, uh, I mean, yes, it functions as a low barrier shelter, but, but I, I think it sends the correct message when we say, would you like, would, if you're looking for opportunity, we have an opportunity center for you. And that could be multi-purpose of services. It doesn't have to only be the shelter aspect. It could be truly a place, there could be other services within something like this that, that are there. Uh, but as we said, you know, we wanna ask people, would you, or if you're looking for opportunity to get off the street, that we can provide that for you. Um, and so um, I'm not saying it, that, that there won't be a low barrier function, of course there will be, but, um, but we're trying to you know, send the message that, that, uh, that we are, this is a hand up that we're looking um, to provide. You know, we're trying to provide a hand up, so. All right, thank you guys.